When the Royal Armouries Museum collection in the Tower of London became too much to handle, they had to find somewhere else, and so this museum in Leeds was built. To give you some idea of the vast array of weapons and armour that was tucked away unseen in the tower, this astonishing display in the Hall of Steel contains more than 3,000 items alone. Some of them from the 17th century, right up to the end of the 19th. In a moment, I'll be going through the museum with Bill Harriman, one of the roadshow's military experts. But while Bill straps on his cuirass, we'll pop back to the Leeds Town Hall to see a few items that we didn't have time to show you on our previous visit. My cousin had it left to him by his employer. By his employer? Yes. Uh, she had no children. Yes. And her husband used to be in the Navy. Yes. And he served her for many, many years and always looked after it. Yes. So when she passed away, she left it to him. Right. And then when he passed away, he left it to my good lady. I have to say, these are often called bracket clocks, but the sheer weight of this one uh, precludes the use of a bracket. You put this on a bracket and there'll be a lovely tinkling noise to hit the floor. Mm. Most English clocks of all ages that are this style are called bracket clocks when they should be more correctly called table clocks. And also, in fact, the style of this goes back much earlier. This sort of brass cast top here is called the basket top. It's far more common at the end of the 17th century than at the end of the 19th century. So it, there's definitely a throwback to it. Now, this is not only a striking clock, it's quarter striking. Yeah. Is that right? Can we just hear it? Indeed, uh, is yes. there a key here? We can open yes, it here, can we? Right. Fine. Okay. So if we take it up here and we'll make some, um, we should hear the hour now. Right. And now we have the great gong at the back. There we go. So it makes it quite a sepulchral noise as yes. it makes there. Now, the chime you heard there was a variation of the Westminster chime, which was previously called the Cambridge chime. So it's obviously taken from Big Ben. It's, it, the yes. chime was taken from that. When we look at the name on it there, it says, uh, yes, Charles Fodgham, clockmaker to the Queen. Quite a lot of clockmakers put clockmaker to the Queen yes. there after it. It wasn't just him, but he certainly was. Mm. He looked after, the Fodgham's looked after the clocks of Buckingham Palace. We do know that. And that name is repeated also, if I turn it round now, on the back. Let's look at the side of it here. It's, it's absolutely amazing and in beautiful condition. You will see that the name is also inscribed down there, Fodgham of London. There's a date underneath there of 1767. I think that's the date actually when the, uh, when the business the was founded. Yes. Uh, and it lasted well into the 20th century, so it, it, it lasted a very long time. It's not the date that the clock was made. No. Uh, the wood on the case is walnut. Let's turn it round again and look at the front. I mean, I was just amazed when I saw it. I think it's, mm. it, it, you see lots of clocks like this um, that were made in Victorian times, and none of them look as good as this one. I've no idea when it would be manufactured, right. which is one of the reasons I brought it right. down. Well, when it was manufactured, let's say towards the end of the 19th century, 1885, 1890, 1895, mm -hmm. round about that period. And the value of this must be at auction, three and a half thousand at least. Uh, if it went for four and a half thousand, I wouldn't be at all surprised either. You know, it really is one of the most wonderful clocks I've seen for a very long time. You know, the first thing that really strikes me about these is how amazingly colourful they are, aren't they? Yes, they are. And then the second thing is just how intricate and complicated the design is, because they're not very big. No, no. But they're so much packed into such a small space. Indeed, yes. Now, tell me a bit about them. Where did they come from? Well, they're a family heirloom. Um, I know they belong to my grandmother, and they were passed down, uh, and they came to me when my mother died in 1976. They came from India because my grandmother's family um, had a, a timber business in India. She actually eloped with a British uh, captain in the British Army really? <laughs> at that time, yes. <laughs> the background from your point of view is that they come from the East, then? They're yes. Indian? In, uh, yes, mm. yes, I believe that they are. Um, I don't think they're Indian, actually. They're from Rome. If you can imagine, in the 19th century, mm. people were travelling and they're going all around Europe and visiting cities and they're visiting Rome mm. and what do they see when they're in Rome? They see all the mosaic floors. Yes. And that's what these are made of. Oh. Now, they're incredibly intricate and mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's actually quite difficult to see 
the detail. But let's just pick one up. Mm. This is a design which is set with tiny individual pieces of glass, glass. forming mm -hmm. a picture yes. in mosaic. Yes. Mm -hmm. This is actually a swan, swan. Yes. on mm -hmm. water, yes. picked out in polychrome colours. Mm -hmm. You've got blues and reds and whites and greens, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's individual tiny, tiny coloured pieces of glass called tesserae, yeah. little okay. cubes of yes. glass. Yeah. But the beauty of your drops for the ears, these earrings, is that they're in absolutely impeccable condition. Yes. So, all right, there we are then, they're middle part of the 19th century, mm -hmm. micro mosaic and gold, drop earrings, mm -hmm. and a very nice size. They're not too long, not too short mm -hmm. value. Well, there's no diamonds or gems, so you have to take a bit of a view on them. Mm -hmm. They are mm -hmm. very much jewellery for the purist. Mm -hmm. But I think because of their exquisite design and condition, I think they're probably worth in auction maybe around a thousand pounds. Oh, <laughs> goodness. I would say it's probably about, probably 1890, something like that. So Victorian rather than moving into the Edwardian period. Right. Is, it, is it a piece you've, you've owned for a long time? Mm. or? No, it's a piece uh, my mother and father owned. Uh, they received it as a wedding present 32 years ago. Right, right, right. And I, I'm looking at it wondering whether or not it's going to have a maker's name on it somewhere because really it's so well made. It's, this is rosewood. Is it rosewood? Brazilian rosewood from South America. Right. But just look at the decoration here. If you look up here, just catch that detail here, this wonderful sort of load moulding. It doesn't really refer to Georgian furniture. It's a straightforward Victorian, good quality piece. And the way these... Have you, have you ever played with this and see the way these doors open? Yeah. Yeah, when we were kids, we used to get into trouble quite regular. Uh, is that you that's broken this one? No, that was my younger brother. <laughs> <laughs> He's not here, he can't defend himself. That's it. But it's so beautifully made. And what I like about it, it's typical of a style there's one designer that comes to mind, George Walton, who's designing furniture in a sort of Scottish Macintosh Art Nouveau way. I'm not saying he designed this, but this shape here, and another designer, W.A.S. Benson, there are all sorts of different designs coming into a melting pot to make what is probably a commercial piece of furniture. And they're often signed on the drawers, but um, I suspect we're not going to find one today. They often have a signature along here, something like that. What I really want to look at is the drawer in here. You can see this very, very unusual type of drawer construction, which is really expensive to make like that. So whoever made this was a top factory, and the first factory that comes to mind for me is Gillows. Gillows. Gillows of Lancaster, retailing also in London. They really were a major maker at this time, and um, started in the 18th century and carried on making furniture of, of the very, very best quality. And whoever's done that has had the time and money to spend on this extraordinary complicated moulding. But when you look at it, it's a mixture of styles, isn't it? We talked about the sort of the vaguely Scottish influence of these octagonal doors, and then you've got a very French influence here. This is typical Louis XV from the mid-18th century. And again, the cabriole leg is Louis XV again. It's a really eclectic mixture. Have you any idea what it's worth today? No, no a clue. No a clue. We was hoping you could help us out. Right, well, that's what I'm here for, but... Uh, I think it's not worth a huge amount, and I think they're undervalued, because I can see it selling for only about a thousand pounds. But we've got to try and find out the exact maker before you yeah, sell it, if you ever do, because right. it that's would really right. help a lot. I yes. love the children, I love the feel of the scene. Yes, kind of peace and tranquility. I don't know whether you know it's painted, but it's actually signed here, in rather a, a small hand here, John Burr. And John Burr was a Scottish artist, and he trained in Scotland, but then came south with his brother and then pretty well stayed south, but still did pictures which I suppose would be associated with Scotland. But I do think what is particularly struck me about it is it's almost a painting of two parts. Um, I particularly like the broad way that the landscape and the cornfield is painted, the way that these birds are rising up from the corn, the cottage and just the peak of it on the top of the hillside there and then we have on the far right side here beautifully drawn the grasses and stumps of an old fence whereas the figures to my mind well painted charming expressions a sweet sentiment about it almost part look as if they've been staged set they've been to my mind slightly placed in the right, picture I can see what you mean 
what I do find is slightly curious here in this picnic basket is what it is a normal bottle here. <laughs> um, it may be that it was ginger beer or something like that, but it does make one think uh, possibly that it might be something else there too. And I think it's been good that it has been kept under glass because in a way um, it hasn't just saved it from the dirt, which can be cleaned off, but quite often restorers do more damage and actually, or certainly used to, to do more damage in taking off old varnish and renewing it. And so it hasn't probably been cleaned too much. And then value-wise, something like five or six thousand pounds. Really? Why, is that somewhat of a surprise? Yes, it is. Yes. Yes, it is. The idea of having a Royal Armouries Museum in Leeds evolved in the early 90s, and the Queen finally opened it in 1996. To bless the site, a Japanese archer loosed a longbow without any arrows into the four compass points of the building, ostensibly to exercise any demons that might still be lurking here. One that he missed was Bill Harriman, who's devilishly well informed on all things military. Bill, what lights your fire about this place? Michael, the whole place lights my fire because for the first time our national collection of arms and armour has its own purpose-built museum and it's not just looking at things in glass cases, there's so much that the visitor can get involved with. There are film shows, interactive media and you see some wonderfully evocative images here from men in steel to machine guns. The thing that I like the best is the wonderful flintlock rifle made by Simpson of York in about 1738, which is a, just a beautiful example of English Rococo craftsmanship and worth something like about a quarter of a million pounds. You sign me up. Hoy the left! Quick march! Who do you think you are kidding, Mr. Uh -huh. Two happy boys with their favourite guns. Now, this is uh, not a beautiful thing, but it was mine own from 1951 to 53. The old Lee Enfield 303. I was a national serviceman, and it served me well. What's yours? Well, this wasn't my national service firearm, you'll be pleased to know. It's a Brown Best musket, which was the British soldier's firearm from about 1715 to 1848 or thereabouts. I liked it so much that in 1975 I blew my first university grant on one rather than pay my tuition fees. And it defined the character of the British infantry throughout all of the important periods, the wars of Spanish succession, Jacobite rebellion, the Seven Years' War, and also the Napoleonic Wars. And it's my favorite because it really defined the character of the British infantry during that period. These terrible volleys of musketry that they put down that just shattered all of Britain's enemies. My story wasn't all glorious because when King George VI died in 1952, lots of our squaddies had to go and line the route of the funeral procession in London, in Green Park, which we did and had to reverse the rifles onto the toe of our boot. We weren't supposed to look, but we did peep, and the rifles slipped off and clattered to the ground, and all around there were murmurs of, what a shower. And were you long in the guardroom? Well, there were too many of us doing it. <laughs> We'd all be in prison for the rest of our lives. So are they good guns, these? The, the Lee Enfield, in my opinion, is the best bolt-action battle rifle ever made. It's got a big magazine capacity, 10 shots, and its bolt is very, very quick to operate. And in skilled hands, it's effective at ranges well up to about 500 metres. Well, it's nice to see an old friend again. You served me well, and you'll remember me, of course, as 227 So this looks like a bit of nut, yeah, carved nut. Where did you get it from? Well, it came from my deceased parents, and it came from them with my grand from my grandparents. I can remember it as a child, you know, as an ornament. Mm. Um, other than that, no idea. Well, it's difficult, really. I mean, it's a typical bit of sailor's work. Yeah. The sailor would be coming back from the South Seas, and he'd bring a coconut with That's him, right, something yeah. he picked up off the <laughs> beach. Right strip all the coil off the outside yeah. of the coconut and reveal the hard nut. You can hear inside, <laughs> it's still got the remnants of the dried <laughs> out <laughs> nut, which is, uh, which is fun. Yeah. Made a little hole to get the juice out, yeah. and then he's carved it up. That's but what I love about it is, it's carved up firstly with the Lord's Prayer, you can read it, it's done in, in proper script and carved in relief. Um, then you re revolve it, and sure enough, there's the image of the vessel, the Calend from Greenock. Um, and in the middle, a little shamrock, which is a nice little feature. And then we go round the corner and there's this sentimental inscription, interlaced hearts, Jewish inscription relating to mother, 
so you yeah. love your mother that's and instead right. of having yeah. to had tattooed on your arm oh, i love my mum right. <laughs> you've written it on your nut right. yeah. and you sort of scratched it in like this it's yeah. very artistic yeah. where this sort of thing gets popular today is in a, a specific type of sail relating mm -hmm. to marine memorabilia yeah. nautical sails uh -huh. and sometimes you get shell work sometimes you get scrimshaw oh, where right. it's scratched yes. into bone and all the yes. rest of it yeah. well this is really a form of scrimshaw yeah. but very elaborate and sophisticated mm -hmm. so that's the sort of auction that it would go into but yeah. if you had to put an auction estimate on it yeah. i think i'd put three to five hundred pounds mm -hmm. four yeah. to six hundred pounds something yeah. like that yeah. and wait and see what happens yeah. great you've got the spigot that's usually the bit that gets lost and there it goes and we've got one wonderful water filter do you use it i personally don't but it was actually used by my mother in a village called Malton near Newmarket when her only source of drinking water was off the roof. And so this was all the drinking water went through this in early 30s, late 20s, I suppose. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? I mean, in the 19th century, clean running water was something that they had to manufacture. Now, this factory in particular, the Dalton factory, is famous for its association with sanitary wares and with sanitation in general. They produced the pipes for London drainage. Uh, and they also produce these water filters. Now, there you have the very, very heavy lid, and inside you've got the carbon filter through which the water uh, eventually feeds into the lower reservoir, and then out it comes of the spigot at the bottom. Now, Dalton had a, a foot in each camp. Here we are up in the potteries, Staffordshire, where the majority of pottery was made in the British Isles. But, of course, Dalton started off in London, in Lambeth. Mm. And this piece was made in Lambeth. It wasn't made up here. Yes, they did have a bridgehead up at Burslem, just a few miles up the road, but here, from, from London, it went to, what, Newmarket, or thereabouts. Yes. yes. And still in use in the 19, what, 20s? Yes, yes. Yeah? Well, I mean, you go to a supermarket today and you buy water filters. Basically, they are the descendants right. of these. Well, today, in a cell room, that would probably fetch in the region of 150 to 250 pounds. Right, right. Over 30 years ago, I bought a house and contents. Yes. And um, this was one of the contents. And was it a big country house or oh, no, was it a no, small no. house? The, the gentleman who unfortunately died is how I came to buy yes. the house. He did collect from country houses. He was a collector and a restorer. And uh, it was a friend of the family. So he would have probably picked it up maybe at a country house auction or something like that. Of that nature, yes. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Although it's only a stool. It's a very grand stool. It's on a much bigger scale than some. And it, to me, it gives the impression that it may have been part of a much larger suite of furniture at some time or other. Now, it's actually in the sort of state that people who collect furniture love to see things first fall. But the design is the thing which really strikes me. It's very elegant, very much in the taste of the George IV period. So what is known as the Regency period, or it was, it was probably dates from the time in the 1820s when the Prince Regent had become George IV. It's got absolutely gorgeous white and gold decoration. And what is most unusual is that the decoration, I suspect, has never been redone. So although it's very dirty, and you can see on the higher surfaces where the gilding's worn and where the dirt is really interfered in the effect it could all be cleaned and i think one would end up with a very genuine surface but it's a very very bold design and interestingly it corresponds very closely with a design which was published in 1826 by somebody who claimed to be a cabinet maker whose name was george smith he published two books he published a book of designs in 1808 and the second volume in 1826 and this stool is almost straight out of that design. Now, George Smith claimed to be a cabinet maker, but no furniture by him has ever come to light. So this is most likely made by another very proficient, I'm sure, London cabinet maker, but after that design. You've had a little bit of restoration on it in one place that I know is in particular, and that's here, where there's obviously been some damage, and that's been replaced, and there's no great problem in getting that put right. In terms of value, even in this state, I would say that you should insure it for four and a half 
to five thousand pounds. Really? It's a very, very good piece of Regency in furniture. In this condition? Even in this condition. And if it were to be restored, it might be worth a bit more, but it would need to be very gently restored. Yes, if it was over-restored, it would almost reduce its value. Yeah. But it's in a state which is perfect to be improved. It's a gorgeous thing. The museum offers what it calls live interpretations, where performers in full costume bring history to life in the most graphic way. Bill, how long could they keep that up? I was say wonderful, wasn't it? Uh, probably for not very long, because the armour was very heavy. It weighed about sort of 40 kilos, which, when you think about it, is like having a small person on your back, yet surprisingly very much less than you would expect to find in the knapsack and the equipment of a World War II infantryman. And everything that they've used there are exact replicas of that which would have been really used for that sort of fighting. This sword is... It's an original, hundreds of years old, which is why, of course, we're wearing gloves. Yes, it's a beautiful late 15th century double-handed fighting sword of the sort that would have been used in that sort of combat. And we have to wear gloves to protect its polished steel surface because our hands exude all kinds of acids and they will actually etch the blade and ruin this wonderful polished surface on it. Well, better than the blade etching itself upon me. Yes, indeed, yes. Anyway, there are the gloves and it's quite heavy. When I've seen the movies, it's always very highly choreographed, all this fighting. Were there very strict rules? Yes, for tournament fighting, there were very strict rules. and They were agreed and sorted out first, and then they were enforced very stringently by the marshal in charge of the tournament. And they were there to make sure that the participants who were there to impress the crowd and the ladies and to show off their chivalric prowess could get in there and have a good scrap, and wherever possible, to make sure that the risk of someone actually being killed was minimised. There were rules, there were also rule changes. The result of one of those sets of rule changes was this wonderful armour made for King Henry VIII. Henry VIII? Now, this isn't what I'd expect at all. I mean, that's a tall, slim man's armour, isn't it? Well, in his youth, he wasn't a fat old chap. He was a very tall, lithe, athletic man who loved and excelled in every kind of sport. And this armour would have been made for him absolutely custom-made, and it would have been as he was at the time when it was ordered. A revelation. So what was this armour made for? Well, it was originally made for foot combat, fighting in the lists, and made in 1520 specifically for the Field of Cloth of Gold, which was this great diplomatic summit between Henry VIII and Francis I of France. And it was a wonderful event, tremendous amount of pageantry, razzmatazz, and it was called the Field of Cloth of Gold because their tents were actually made of cloth of gold, which was the top end of the social fabric, so to speak. Talking of social fabric, um, what is the technical term for this particular item of menswear? Well, in the, in the vulgar term, it's known as a codpiece, but um, we arms and armour historians have a posher word for it, which is a brayet, which comes from a French word, bray, which means underpants. And is that uh, king size? Or? Well, most definitely, in this case, king size. If you look at the rest of the armour, you can see that it's beautifully articulated. And you think how complicated the human body is with all those joints. This allows somebody who is inside that to do everything that he could without it. And the innovation comes from the top part here. These are known as the pauldrons. And the pieces, the plates that they're made from, articulate upwards rather than downwards, which was the norm at the time. So this was absolutely the cutting edge of armour-making bespoke technology at the time. I would never get into one, but it's a work of art. My late mother-in-law gave me it uh, about five years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, she, she said she'd actually bought it in Dunkeld House Hotel nice. in the early 60s. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but it is Tinnebrewer. Uh, right, yep. In 1864, I understand, because the, the actual date is on the Absolutely painting. Absolutely right. Yes. We've, we've got the inscription here for Tinnebrough, and also the date, 11 yes. September 1868. Yes. A painting of this title, or of this subject, was exhibited at the Royal Scottish Academy in Edinburgh in 1869. Waller Hugh Payton was one of the first Scottish artists to paint out of doors. Yes, yes. And what this is likely to be, I think, is, is basically a watercolour sketch, albeit in a very complete form, of a painting that would have been exhibited at the Royal Scottish Academy. Yes. Presumably this is one of the sea locks of the Firth of Clyde. And this wonderful assemblance 
of um, steam yachts, sailing craft and fishing boats, whether it's some regatta or whether perhaps... Yes, it looks like a regatta as the yachts are dressed overall. Yeah, uh, well, you, they've, they've got their sort of signal pennants there, haven't they? Yes. So there's a wonderful um, range of colour, but also I think what's interesting is just the remarkable detail and delicacy about the execution of the work. You know, you choose any area of this composition and there's so much going on, whether it's the sort of figures in the, the sort of rowing boat here, um, all the sort of activity in the shoreline. Yes. There's a great deal of activity. It's a beautiful watercolour. It's in very nice condition. I would expect this picture to sell for in the region of three to four thousand pounds at auction. And for insurance purposes, I'd certainly be advising at least five thousand pounds. My dad bought his first business about 40 years ago. Yeah. Um, it was found at uh, the back of his shop. Um, in a bit of a bad way, and my dad um, really, really liked it, so he got it um, cleaned up and put in a case, and it's been in our family ever since. For some reason, railway modelling doesn't really get into its stride oh, until the 1860s, 70s, 80s, right. the latter part of the century. Mm -hmm. The early models that do exist tend to be engineering models to demonstrate a particular technique, a particular technology, what have you, yeah. and they are extremely rare from this period. So, First of all, how do we know the period? Well, the most magical thing about this to me is on the steam dome here, there is an inscription. And it is an extraordinary thing, which I will attempt to read. It says, by desire of the directors, I have to summarize it. What it says is, by the desire of the directors of the Edinburgh and Glasgow Railway, this locomotive was demonstrated in the boardroom at Queen Street Station in Glasgow in 1849 to amuse the Prince of Wales on the occasion of the Queen Victoria and Albert's first visit to Glasgow, 1849. And it was made by somebody called Peter Gow in Linlithgow the previous year. So in 1849, the Prince of Wales was seven, and it would have been perfect. Yeah. And you can imagine him coming with his parents to Glasgow, thinking, and the, and the director's thinking, what are we going to do with this child? I know we'll set up a toy train for him to, 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 to look at. And this must have been running up and down in the boardroom in Queen Street, with Queen Victoria and Albert sort of standing there, nodding, <laughs> and the Prince of Wales getting very excited, seeing a miniature train. Uh -huh. When you got it, was it like this? No, no, it was very dirty and very rusty. My dad actually but got it. Was it, it coloured? Or... Um, yes, it had bits of paint on it, not a lot. And what sort of colours were those? Do you well, remember? He, he just replaced he, the colours, just tried to match them. Yes, uh -huh. I have to say, it's a pity you repaint, not you, your father yeah. repainted it. <laughs> you can see the paintwork is quite... Yeah. If I say crude, I'm not criticising him, no, no, but it's yeah. been brush drawn. Yeah. And um, that does affect it, which is a great pity, because yeah. a collector is very concerned about authenticity, originality, and even chipped old paint, yeah. I have to say, is better than Good. shiny new paint. Because of the story, because of the association, because it is, as I say, the first royal toy train, I'm going to put £5,000 on it. Admiral Lord Nelson yes. and the Duke of Wellington, two great British heroes and exciting pieces of porcelain. What do you know about them? I didn't know anything about them until 8.30 last night when uh, we had a visitor to our kitchen. Oh, right. And uh, she knew that we were coming here on another presentation and uh, asked if we would present those two to the porcelain side of the the, the, the exhibition. So. Oh, right, so you're just trying to have any history of them herself? Yes, it, there, there's a background of um, great great grandmother uh, whose brother was in the Navy and oh, was right. a surgeon in the Navy and died sort of pre-1900. And that's oh, about as much as I can right, so tell an, you. A naval background, a naval so background. appropriate to collect a medallion of Nelson. Absolutely, yeah. Right, well, what we have are portrait medallions made at Worcester and modelled by one of the great ceramic sculptors, a man called Thomas Baxter. I see, yeah, yeah. And Thomas Baxter had really close links himself with Nelson yes. early on when he worked in London. He was a miniaturist yes. and he painted portraits of Emma Hamilton yes. and of Nelson oh, yes, yes. and had links. He visited Nelson's home down at Merton and oh. made a lot of pieces especially for Nelson and Emma Hamilton. Oh, yes. And this is slightly later in his career, he came to Worcester. Oh. We have on the back of these medallions, the very proudly written factory mark. Yes. And we've got there, Light Bar and Bar, Royal Porcelain Works, Worcester. And Thomas Baxter arrived in Worcester in 1814. He was a painter. He was also a very talented modeler. 
and had modelled Nelson earlier from life. Yes. He's also here modelled Wellington. And it's done at the time when Wellington was just getting really famous, famous yeah. in 1814 and 1815. Yeah. But Thomas Baxter would have done the duelling. And that border is superb. Uh -huh, when that, you actually look of... closely at it, um, each little tiny jewel there is coloured enamel paste, yes. raised up, placed on top of gold, mm. and fired in the kiln, yeah. and uh, very superbly evenly done all the way around. Yeah. And he also did the blue ground lay, he did the whole lot, yeah. and very few were made. Yeah. Um, these are very rare. Are there were a lot of collectors who would, would love these. So, so does your friend have an idea of their value? Well, I, I do know that um, something like five years ago, she, mm -hmm. she did have them valued at roughly about £500 for the tier. I think to, to the right collectors who know Baxter's work and know Nelson and Wellington, two great names, lots of collectors, I would have thought we're near uh, £4,000 for the pair. For the pair. They will be delighted. One of the things that they do so well at the Royal Armouries is these life-size tableaus, which are incredibly realistic. And the one that we have here is the Battle of Pavia in 1525, fought between the French and the Imperialist troops. And you can see the French knights on their big armoured horses, not much different from some of the armours that we looked at earlier with Henry VIII. And here we have the infantry, the sort of gun-toting working classes, armed with rudimentary early firearms that were capable of dealing with armour, almost like anti-tank guns are today. So they've got guns, but they're still using pikes. The pikes are very important. It's the classic anti-cavalry charge tactic, where the pikes actually hold the cavalry, stop the manoeuvring, and the guns are used to kill the individual riders, the armour piercing. The same principle was used at Agincourt, but the difference here is that these men with guns could be trained very quickly, you could get any old peasant off the field, put an arquebus in his hand, give him a day, a few days training, and he would be potentially effective. The difference with a longbowman was that he had to train from a very early age and he had to be a big, fit chap, but the principles are both there. So what we're seeing here is the end of medieval warfare and the new techniques coming in. Yes, and those new techniques I'm going to show you now. And how far does this get us? Well, Michael, it takes us on about 125 years from the Battle of Pavia, and it's then as a hockebus armour. Armour? Well, there's not much of that inside, is there? And that yellow jacket must have been a bit of a target. Well, there's actually more armour in it than first meets the eye. Obviously, on the top of his head, he's got a thick steel helmet, known as a hockebusier's pot, and then his main body protection comes from this very thick leather jerkin known as a buff coat. On one side, he has a short firearm, or a carbine, or a harquebus slung, which gives him his name. And on the other side, he has a sword slung from a baldric. A baldric? So what is a baldric? A baldric's a belt. <laughs> a belt. I always thought so. Smallest paintings in the world. 20 would fit on a postage stamp. Queen buys two. And here they are. What must be the smallest paintings in the world? They're quite incredible. Yeah. Tell me about them. Well, they came into my possession about... 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. They were given to me by an elderly family friend in Folkestone. Um, she'd had them a number of years, but I don't know their earlier history. It um, says, now you, now you are satisfied, Mrs. Catchpole. Was it this Mrs. No, Catchpole? It wasn't, no. Mrs. Catchpole, uh, you have now got my smallest, and then he signs it again there. Yes, That's yes, quite incredible. Yes. And then he goes on here. Her Majesty was first interested in Mr. Birchett's work in 1923 when she accepted from him a miniature painting of the cenotaph to hang on the walls of the Queen's Doll's House. And then, presumably, uh, these are actually smaller than I think the they ones in the be, Doll's they House. They must be, yes, because yes. he actually states so in his little note. And I think it's a very good idea to keep them under glass like this because, you know, one breath of wind and they're gone, yes. aren't they? Yes. Are they watercolours or are yes, they all? Yes, they are watercolours. Um, I mean, I have to use a magnifying glass to, to appreciate them, <laughs> but it does say in the um, newspaper article that they were painted with, with the naked eye, uh, with no magnification at all, and that at times he used just a single hair as his paintbrush. He must have had sort of telescopic sight, I think. And, and why would he want to do it? That's the other. No idea. Well, I think as less is more, I'm going to value these, seeing as there are some in the royal collection, I'm going to value these three at a thousand pounds. Good gracious me. <laughs> I think they're an enormous piece of fun, and there are always collectors around for this type I'm of surprised. thing. 
It was my grandfather's. My grandfather brought it in the 1950s. Yes. Um, my grandma passed it on to me. Well, that's marvellous, isn't it? Because what looks like a standard dining table reveals the solid oak, blonde oak leaves, and what we've got underneath is this great little snooker table. And I bet the children have loved it, haven't they? Well, they do. The five-year-old's not allowed near it yet. No five-year-old's on this table. No five-year-old's. Well, because let's see, it's built by uh, Mr Riley of Accrington and solidly made. Riley started making billiard tables around 1900, 1899 to 1900. And this compact convertible dining table model was very popular. They started making it in the 20s. Um, and do you know when this one was actually made? Did, did your grandfather buy it or...? We've got the brochure for 1951-52, which I've assumed is when he made the purchase for it. Yes. Well, that would be about right. So a long production run for Riley's with these things. You convert it from a dining table by picking Lifting it up it from up, below, yeah. and it goes on those kind of cantilevered arms, which is yeah. really clever. It's a, fan it's a fantastic object, and in brilliant condition. And you've got some accessories. We've got the scoreboard. The scoreboard, yeah. yeah and yeah, a we've box. had that out on the wall occasionally. Yes, and a, and, a, and a good box of balls and all the rest of it. Yeah. Um, at auction, you're likely to get about fifteen hundred to two thousand pounds. Really? That sort of price. You should insure it for two and a half thousand pounds. It was given to me by an elderly gentleman, friend of the family, um, and he just knew we liked me and my daughter liked horses, and said, "Would I like it?" And I said, "Yes, thank you very much," and put it up on the sort of shelf and that. And but you've looked at it ever since. Yeah. He's actually made in the early years of the 20th century um, by a chap called Louis de Monard, who's a Frenchman, obviously made of bronze with this wonderful sort of very nicely sort of worn patination. And Louis de Monard was following in a very well-established tradition, which the French established in the middle of the 19th century, of doing what we call animalia bronzes. Uh, in other words, they took the idea of the horse or any other animals and really sort of concentrated on, on what the horse actually looked like. And by the early 20th century, which is when, when this was done, I think they really got it right. I just like the way he's observed the whole thing of getting the leading rein stuck around the, the leg and then it comes all the way back here and there's a, um, a drape going over. So in terms of actually how you observe a horse, um, Absolutely brilliant. Now, if you were a betting lady and uh -oh. wanted to put money on the horses, uh -oh. <laughs> what would you think he'd romp home at in terms of value? Hopefully maybe £500, but I don't know. You could probably add a naught to that. Pardon? Yeah, I think you could certainly add a naught to that. I think we should be looking more on the region, certainly from an insurance point of view, of £5,000. Yeah, I think he's wonderful. Well, I was very struck by the way in which her white apron is framed by these colours and also the relationship between, I think this is a maid and the little girl, and they're both concentrating so hard on, on their sewing. And I think the little girl is probably sewing something for her doll. It just seemed a very loving relationship between the two women. The, the woman and the, and the little girl. And, and quiet. Yes. I think that the light is amazing, don't you? Clicking yes. a, a, brilliantly across that picture. Yes. And uplighting the maid's face and backlighting the little girl's head so that her profile is lost in shadow. Yes. It really is a pretty picture, isn't yes, it? Yes, it is. It's lovely. I fell in love with it. That's why I bought it. I mean, it, um, it was, I felt, the absolutely outstanding picture in this exhibition that yeah. I went to. Um, but it was by no means the most expensive, so it just seemed I had to have it. <laughs> That's interesting. I think it is a Scottish painting, so... Uh, yeah, yes, definitely. I mean, J James Carr Lawson, born in Scotland, but actually, I think at a very young age, his parents emigrated to Canada, and he was taught art there, um, and only returned to, to, to Europe later on in his life, where he did become quite influential. Anyway, I, I'm sorry, I've got to come back to the money. <laughs> You want me to tell you how much I paid for it? Well, I don't want well, to push you for it. I bought like it in, in 1980. Yeah. Um, and I paid, I can't remember whether it was less, just less or just over a thousand pounds for it. Oh, it struck me at the time as a very large amount of money for me to be spending, but I was just 
so struck by this painting, so I bought it. I think any amount of money for a painting is, is quite, actually quite a big leap. It's like a diving board, you know, it's, it's yes. really a scary moment. Yes. And you only really know years later when you're living with the picture that, that, that it was worth it and you're glad you'd spent it. Yes. I think now you've really got to be uh, looking at about £8,000 for this picture, at right. least. That's it's a very beauty. nice, yes. Thank you very much. Bill, this is very cute. What is it? Is it out of a Christmas cracker? No, Michael, but it's a cracker in itself. It's a Calibri, and it's the smallest automatic pistol ever made. But not deadly. Yes, absolutely deadly. And this brings us to the self-defence gallery. This is all about firearms for personal protection, and people don't realise, I think, that many years ago, people carried firearms for personal protection completely routinely. People like travellers, pilgrims, and particularly ladies, they would have carried something like this little flintlock pistol here. It's known to us today as a muff pistol because it was often carried by ladies in these big fur muffs, but it could have been carried in a handbag or any other convenient place. And it's made in about 1820 in Sheffield, and it's recently been acquired by the museum from a local auction for about a thousand pounds. So the museum is always on the lookout for new items? Yes, it's by no means a static collection, and they're always looking to acquire new items. And recently they've obtained a pretty unremarkable English hammer gun, but it was actually presented to John Brown by Queen Victoria. And also the Manton pistols, which I found at Buxton last year on the roadshow, they belong to General John Jacob, who was a statesman and soldier on the Northwest Frontier. They've been lent to the museum. So there's this constant acquisition to reinforce the display and also to create this wonderful research facility, which is also about unravelling stories, which is so dear to us on the roadshow. The Oriental galleries here at the Leeds Armouries are quite fascinating. But a really glittering prize is Japanese armour, given by the then Shogun's son to King James I in 1613, the very first Japanese armour to be seen in Britain. In the Oriental gallery you'll find one of the museum's icons, elephant armour, no less. It's very rare, of course. In fact, it's the only example of its kind in a public exhibition anywhere. It weighs over 250 pounds, plus the elephant. Imagine trying to stop that. But that's where we have to stop, I'm afraid. So many thanks to the Royal Armouries Museum for their hospitality and to Bill Harriman for sharing his expertise. Until the next time, keep your powder dry. And from Leeds, goodbye. <laughs> They save lives, but how are they trained? Follow the work of mountain rescue dogs next tonight on BBC One at the Animal Hospital.